Now, let me introduce Michelle Malentin. I only met her a few days ago, but she's done some excellent work. I believe her postdoc work is all around ARDS and ventilator-induced lung injury. She is a professor at uh, Colorado Mesa University, and she's a specialist in this. I wish we could give her more time. Um, she's going to talk, and then Dr. Eric Schultz uh, is going to take over. So thank you. All right. Thanks for that introduction. I'll go ahead and get started. Um, before I begin, I just want to go ahead and um, thank uh, my collaborators when I was a postdoc, um, because I'll be talking about a bunch of research that they assisted um, and helped me with and, and things that I was working on. All right, so the goal of my presentation is really to define the problem um, from my perspective, which is how do you ventilate someone safely with acute respiratory distress syndrome or ARDS? And so safely, I think is the key word here in the thing um, that I really kind of want to uh, uh, get you guys thinking about throughout this uh, short little talk. And I wanna start from a place that is um, really looking at uh, lung anatomy, so we're really all on the same page. And so one of the ways I like to think about the lung is through a tree analogy. So if you think about the trachea as the trunk of the tree, and then as your tree begins to branch out, uh, as your branches get smaller and smaller, you would have leaves on the ends, but instead of leaves, we have alveoli, which are air sacs. In COVID-19, the virus actually targets a cell within the alveoli, which is a type two cell. And these are the cells that actually make surfactant in the lung. And surfactant plays a very important role in terms of reducing surface tension forces so that when you breathe, your lung can readily open. So when we're talking about acute respiratory distress syndrome or ARDS, this is characterized by the point in which you have sufficient fluid or edema in your lungs such that you can no longer breathe to keep yourself alive. And you must breathe, you must have basically a machine that is going to replace normal breathing for you. So once you would get to that point and you would need to be mechanically ventilated, you would have ARDS. In a pre-COVID era, um, ARDS was actually something that was a, a concern and something that we were working to solve. In the United States with the best care available to you, if you're being mechanically ventilated with ARDS, you had a 40% mortality rating. So your odds of making it were only 60%. In a COVID-19 era, this has dropped to 50%. So it means your chances of making it are 50-50. Pre-COVID-19, this caused 75,000 annual deaths in the United States, and of course, this number is much, much higher. Many researchers that study ARDS, as I did and still do, um, feel that to improve care, we need a couple of things. And one of these is models that can help us identify what safe ventilation is for each individual. And this would allow us to develop more customized care in the clinic. So really ARDS is hard to treat. And what I wanna do is help kind of give you some ideas about why it's hard to treat so that you can kind of keep this in mind as you would be working on different projects. So if you're someone who's a little bit queasy, I would encourage you to look away for a few seconds. But if you, so here's an example of what a healthy lung looks like. So this is a lung that hasn't been ventilated. It's been inflated and tied off. And this is actually a pig lung. So if you look at this lung, you see this nice healthy tissue, um, this kind of foamy substance here, we have surfactant. And then if you have a lung that has been ventilated. So the lung in A and then the cross section of it in C has actually been ventilated in a pretty safe way. Uh, the lung in B and D, however, has not. And you don't necessarily need to be a clinician to uh, look at the lung in B and D and be like, I really wouldn't want my lung to look like that. And one of the differences between how these two lungs were ventilated is the degree of strain of the tissue. So if you have something that had low dynamic strain, so the lung was prevented from repetitively uh, collapsing and then overstretching, um, you're going to have something where you have a little bit of injury, some kind of the sparse, sparse kind of splotchy coloring would indicate uh, some damage. But really, when you look at the high dynamic strain lung, you see sections of the lung that were truly blown out. And really, the darker the red, the more um, blood and other things that had gotten into the lung in that particular region. 
So if you actually take a cross section of the lung tissues, this is a cross section of actually a mouse's lung. And when I look at this lung as someone who studied this from a modeling and engineering perspective, what I see is something that is highly mechanically interdependent. So all of these little kind of bubbles that you would see in here, this are actually the walls of the alveoli. And the alveoli in the lung, they're highly mechanically interdependent. So they're sharing walls with one another. And they're actually, as you see, kind of these larger cross sections here are gonna be more airways. But when I think about this from a mechanics point of view, and if we zoom in more to these alveoli, you can see they're all sharing walls. We have a healthy lung, and then we have an ARDS lung that's been injuriously ventilated. And in this particular uh, micrograph, the sort of blue regions that you see here, see here would indicate edema um, or some amount of fluid in these um, different little air sacs, which is where gas exchange can occur. So this is a, a SEM image or a scanning electron microscope image, which looks at the surface inside some of these alveoli. And I like showing this image when I talk about sort of the two main mechanisms of ventilator induced lung injury. So when a machine is breathing for you, we can have a couple of different things happen. We can have what's called atelectrauma, which is when you would cyclically reopen and collapse one of the alveoli in the lung. And you can have what's called volutrauma, which is when you overinflate and over distend or overstretch some sort of region in the lung. And in the field that studies the, the respiratory structure function of people that have ARDS, um, it's really a combination of these two things that can lead to the most injurious kinds of ventilation. So when you look at this healthy lung, you can actually see a junction right here between two different kinds of cells. And when you look at the surface of an unhealthy lung, you see a lot of different things. You see macrophages, you can see a red blood cell here, you can see that it's been teared. And if you think about what happens in um, this idea of something cyclically opening and, re and collapsing, it's have you ever taken a piece of sticky tape and you put it between your fingers and you find that when you put it in between your fingers, it kind of sticks together. And then eventually there's some point where you would rip maybe it off of one side of your fingers and it goes on to the other. That can actually help happen within an alveolus. And the cell, if you deplete the surfactant sufficiently by introducing um, more uh, particulates in there that would um, disrupt surfactant function, this can actually lead one cell membrane to stick to another and actually rip uh, the surface of one cell off into another. So really, my perspective is that everything within the lung is mechanically interdependent. And another thing that makes uh, ARDS harder to treat is that the injury is unevenly distributed. So if we can understand how ARDS spreads in the lung, then maybe we can treat it better. So because the lung is mechanically interdependent, the microscale forces can influence regional stability. So this is a one dimensional finite element network that I developed as a postdoc. And you can see where we have these darker blue regions indicate more flooding, lighter blue is less flooding, and then no blue is no flooding. So this would be a network of alveoli. And the darker the red would indicate higher strain. So you could see if one alveolus is, is collapsed, because of the surface tension forces being great due to the presence of edema, then what we have is higher strain in all of the neighboring alveoli. One thing that I would note is while there are a lot of patient specific models, I would, I don't know if I think these models are really ready for prime time and I would be willing to debate that with some of you on Slack. Um, heterogeneous strain is really the most injurious kind of strain that you can have in the lung and I think you could see that um, from the pig images. But unfortunately, it's really hard to avoid some high amount of strain because high strain and high pressure are needed to open up the most injured areas of the lung. So what is safe ventilation in one region of the lung can be unsafe ventilation in a neighboring region of the lung. So in summary, what this means is if you have COVID-19 and this develops into viral pneumonia, this can progress to ARDS, and you would be on a ventilator from days to weeks. So identifying what safe ventilation is becomes even more challenging due to the fact that the mechanical properties of your lung would be changing fairly rapidly. So care is difficult. Um, and with that, uh, feel free to email me if you have more questions um, and I will be answering questions on Slack. Okay, so we need to go very quickly here. There was a, con uh, you're getting um, thanked by Teresa Barnes uh, for your work on this 
Um, thank you very much. We're going to have to go on to Dr. Schultz. I saw a very complicated question go by about um, CPAP and pulse oximetry. I think we're going to have to wait to save that. So why don't you um, go ahead, uh, Eric? Eric, are you ready? You may have to unmute yourself. I'll unmute you, Eric. DP, can you unmute? Uh, Dr. Schultz? Yes, Robert. Okay. Hello. Great, Eric, we can hear you now. Great, and if I can start my video, that would be great too. Um, I. I hope, I'm hoping I can share my screen, Robert. Uh, that will work. Um, you should be able to share your screen. It looks like DP has your slides there. If you would prefer. Okay, I would just if I could go through them. That might be easiest if. Uh, go if ahead, I may. Yes, of course. Go okay, for. thank you. Uh, thank you, and I'm, I'm apologies if there's any confusion because okay. I'm sharing. Uh, While Eric is um, setting it up, let me introduce him just a little bit. Let me know when you're ready, Eric. So Eric is an anesthetist, which in America would be called an anesthesiologist in, um, uh, in Brisbane, I believe, Australia. And the great thing That's that right. he's done is he's written a four volume introduction to engineers around this basic problem. Okay, are you ready to go, Eric? Uh, I am, I am. So thank, thanks Take very away. much, Robert. So, um, whoops, so, uh, yeah, so this is this is me. Um, this is me about ten years ago. Actually, I don't look that young anymore. And that's the hospital that um, I work in. So um, thanks, Robert, very much for organising this conference and to Public Invention. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge that I'm sitting here in in Australia, and in in Australia, the white people just arrived and um, stole the country off the Aboriginal people, and never really recognised that or had a treaty. Um, so that many of us in this country like to acknowledge that whenever we meet. Um, so there's a lot to talk about and I appreciate this time's uh, quite tight. So um, in my slides, I've linked up to two um, documents. I'm going to try not to repeat the detail that's in those. Um, the first link here is the document that Robert's alluded to, um, which is my, my four volume tome on uh, what engineers need to know about ventilators from a doctor's perspective. And the, the um, the second link is to a, a scrappier set of notes that I've just looked at as I've, I've hit PubMed and I've looked at the literature um, and looked at the recommendations coming out of the intensive care societies in the UK and Europe and the USA um, in the last week. Uh, last, you know, and I've tried to really um, extract the absolute up to the minute um, thinking um, from those bodies so that we could... Um, um, use that as a foundation for um, what we decide and what we do from here. Um, yeah, so Robert asked me to address the question of, of what doctors need from us. And I think, you know, primarily we need less patients. I mean, that is the critical thing. Um, and there's a whole bunch of aspects to giving us less patients, washing our hands and staying away from each other and, and wearing face masks and all the things that the public health people are telling us. I mean, that, that's, that's so important. Um, we need a lot more data. I'll get into this a little bit more. Um, but we need randomised controlled trials of the various therapies that are available. It's extraordinarily difficult um, to translate a gut instinct um, into reliable, um, yeah, into reliable facts that are actually the truth. Or I should, what I should say is, it's it's difficult to filter out what our gut instincts are and identify the ones that are actually true and which ones are just biased by our own experience and, and or, or biased by the fact that most patients live or most patients die or there's other factors going on. So randomised controlled trials are really critical as we move forward. Um, and, and quite, um, quite uh, possibly we may need more um, ventilators. Certainly, I mean, as Robert's pointed out, you know, six, six weeks ago, everybody was saying, oh my God, we're gonna run out of ventilators. We need tens and thousands of these things. Then it appears that it's got a bit more complicated. So I wanna unpack that a little bit. Um, it certainly may well be the case that 
um, countries like Brazil and others that Robert mentioned do need high quality ventilators. So, um, and that's really where the my four volume tone um, comes in, uh, is that high quality ventilator um, design and, and modularity that Robert has emphasized. Um, how did I get involved? Um, so I'm, I'm an anaesthetist, so I put people to sleep and wake them up again, um, generally, or um, I do a lot of maternity work as well. So I, I stab a lot of pregnant ladies in the back with big needles um, and help them have their babies. Uh, but, and six weeks ago, or four weeks ago, I was, I was, I like everyone else, was a little bit alarmed by what was going on and um, was stuck at home for various reasons and ended up watching YouTube and seeing all these videos of these very clever engineers um, making these machines that were going to be grossly inadequate. I could just tell by looking at them that I thought, oh, you're just off on the wrong foot here. Well, you need a bit of a briefing. So that's that's what I um, set out to um, to do. And so, so I realized that um, most people were working on solutions that just were not gonna come close to meeting um, the requirements of what we were imagining. Um, but at the same time, I think I, I came to exactly the same realization that Robert came to, which was if people worked together a little bit more and broke the problem down into small components, and if, if people each took one individual chunk, that the problem is not impossible, it's not intractable. Um, the, the problem is more complicated than a lot of people have realized, but it's not more complicated by an order of magnitude. It's maybe two or three times more complicated. Um, so I still felt very hopeful that um, there is a solution and that we could deliver ventilators that were really excellent and would save lives, but we just needed to change the way that we went about it. Um, so what's important in a surge ventilator? Um, I think there's a couple of things that we can just dump immediately. Um, one is, is the weight. I think it, you know, we don't really need lightweight ventilators. These exist already. Um, we've got self-inflating bags. If we need to get someone in a chopper, and get them from one center to another or in the back of an ambulance or whatever. We've, we've got them to do that. We've, we, we've got enough of these short-term ventilators and they're designed to be used for a couple of hours or so. And maybe there's someone squeezing the bag manually or maybe there's not, but yeah, this isn't really where the shortfall is gonna be. It's, so we don't really need portable ventilators. So if, if we're making something which is heavy um, and it's got a car battery in it or something, that's really not a problem at all. We'll put some wheels on it and, you know, hospitals have got pretty good floors and they're used to sort of very heavy patients and very heavy beds wheeling around on them. And we can put this ventilator in a trolley. Yeah, I don't think there'd be many ICU ventilators that would come in under 50 kilograms. Um, so weight's not really a big problem. We don't need to make this thing light. I think the other thing that um, people got misguided on is trying to come up with designs that were too cheap. You know, the, we don't really need a $100 ventilator. Um, providing intensive care is extraordinarily expensive. It's about, you know, it's, it's at least $3,000 a day for an ICU bed, you know, $1,000 a day at least for a regular hospital bed. So you, when we're making these ventilators, we need to bear that in mind. And, and even in the third world, you can argue that the cost will be a lot less than that it's still going to be a significant cost. So if we've got, if we're making a cheap ventilator that results in people staying a day longer in hospital than they need to be, that's going to be a false economy. So we, uh, you know, we can release ourselves of the requirement to make the cheapest possible ventilator. You know, we're competing with commercial devices that are 10 or $20,000. So, I mean, I mean, I think allowing yourself a thousand dollar budget and yeah, possibly won't need to come close to this, but just give ourselves the freedom of, of um, you know, spending a little bit of money on the hardware that we need to make something that's going to work. Um, what is important? Failing safety safely is really important. I don't think um, reliability is great, um, but it's not critical. What's, what I believe is really critical is if, if you do become unreliable, yeah, if, you're, if your ventilator becomes unreliable, it needs to do so in a, in a graceful way, which means that the people in the intensive care unit can step in and intervene immediately um, and, and take over, can just disconnect the patient from your machine, which is which is given up the ghost and just use a self-inflating bag till another machine gets um, wheeled in. So I think that's the critical thing when it comes to reliability. Um, being available when it's needed. Now this is really important and this sort of, this cuts across that issue with the component costs in that the actual cost of a component may not be expensive, 
But the fact that there's a six month delay in getting that component shipped out from an overseas manufacturer, that may well be a, um, a major barrier. So while cost isn't a problem, you know, we need, you know, we probably need to be making um, machines that are, uh, that we can procure the parts from very quickly. Um, Robert alluded to accurate, reliable controls. Um, yeah, I believe that you know, any ventilator that's going to be worthwhile in this crisis is going to require excellent patient synchronisation. Um, and I talk about that a fair bit in the in the document and, and more so in, in volume three. And that's, that requires a couple of things. Um, primarily, it requires really good sensors within the machine and it requires a mechanism which is able to be quite dynamic and responsive to the patient's own respiratory effort. Um, and I, Robert alluded to the... Go ahead. Yeah. Let me yep. let me interrupt. I just want to remind you, um, if you're going to take questions, you've only got about five minutes left, and okay. so at 15 after we have to go to the next. Session. Sure. Okay. Uh, you okay. are getting a few questions, which I'll uh, present to you. Later. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, so, so simple, Robert. Simple um, idiot proof uh, interface is going to be vital in that the ICUs are going to be staffed with people who are either going to be very overworked and very tired, or they're going to be very ex inexperienced. Um, so that's important. Um, so the caveats I went through, other than ventilators, ICUs need a whole bunch of things other than um, ventilators, so it's important that we recognise that. Um, so human respiratory physiology is very complicated, and the really good news is you don't need to understand it. Um, I think the alcoholic's prayer is really important here. You can control the things that you can control, which is pressure flows, temperature, humidities, and oxygen concentration. So if you as engineers worry about that, you can leave the physiology to us. But I just wanted to chuck some complicated graphs in here to confuse you all. Um, and the main thing with these graphs is, is they are, this is fundamental respiratory physiology, but the important point here is that they're, they're non-linear. There's a bunch of non-linear stuff going on. So if things don't make sense to you, it's because of these non-linearities. Um, and there's a bit more physiology for you. I've looked at absolutely the latest guidelines and you know it, it's, it appears that there've been some changes on, in thinking and there's now two types of ARDS. We only used to think of one type and now we've got H type and L type. Um, and I won't have time to get into that. And it's probably not relevant, um, but we still do need ventilators. The evidence base guiding all of this is, is quite weak. And I think that's an important point to make, um, which speaks to my earlier um, point about needing randomized controlled trials. This is the latest evidence and the, the strength of um, the strength of evidence that the experts feel have got guiding their different recommendations. And this is, all of these um, panels are just from documents published in the last several weeks in very reputable journals. Um, this is the ICU data coming out of the UK on 15th of May. And I think this slide's really important. And for people um, who've heard these statistics about terrible mortality rates from ventilated patients. It's just important to remember that it's the sick patients that get ventilated and they'll always do worse than patients who don't get ventilated. Um, and this illustrates some of the patterns there and shows that in, in younger patients, the successful discharge rate is very high in younger patients. And, but, the, in, but, it's, um, but the outcome in older patients is quite poor. Uh, and that's worth considering. Um, the commonest um, problems I've experienced or seen in the in the ventilators that I've looked at um, is that they're grossly underpowered and they've got poor user interfaces and inadequately um, instrumented in the dangerous failure modes. Um, I just want to talk about the power briefly um, and this is something for the whole family here. The, the, the important thing about power is you can use a powerful gentle, a ventilator gently um, and it's easier to be gentle if you've got enough strength to be gentle. And I think that's that's a subtle but important um, point, which is why I think you know, we should be aiming for ventilators that can deliver peak flow rates, rates of 150 litres a minute um, as a peak output. And then we can finally regulate that. Um, and this is just the modularity um, where I'd started to break down the ventilator. And this is just a cut and paste from my um, document that you can look at. Um, and I just just a, a comment on the um, on the hoods that are being popular. It's just worth noting for all your engineers out there that these are running on a, a fresh gas flow of around seventy five liters per minute. And if these get deployed in large volume in the third world, they're going to need an awful lot of fresh oxygen. Um, and I just want to mention that I think there's some scope to uh, to redesign these hoods in such a way that they don't require 
such a tremendous um, fresh gas flow. The, to, just to put this in perspective, the, uh, humans typically consume about 200 millilitres per minute. So if you're having a, if you're connecting someone to a device where you're requiring 75 litres, you're, you're wasting a tremendous amount of oxygen. So whether we redesign these with some bulbs or things in them so they don't rebreathe, or using some um, um, soda lime to scrub the cup and dioxide out so that you can reduce the fresh gas um, flow. There's, there's some opportunities to optimize this and that would be critical if these things are gonna be deployed in the third world. Um, so I just wanted to highlight, it's, it's coming up to 1 a.m. here and I have to, I've got a case in the morning um, at 7 a.m. I'm gonna be off delivering some babies. Um, so I'm not going to be able to stay around for the rest of the session, but I will be around on the weekend and I will visit Slack and answer questions and I will look at comments on the documents as well. But I'm happy to take, I'll hang around for a little while and I'm certainly happy to take um, comments now, uh, Robert. So that's that's okay. all I have. Thank you. And, and I apologize to the whole conference. All the speakers are going to be under time pressure because we packed a lot of speakers into three and a half hours. So I, I don't want to be rude to Dr. Schultz. Or, uh, or Professor uh, Malentin, but let me uh, let me ask a few questions. Um, is uh, how important is capnography along with ventilators? Um, that is very important. Um, uh, it's possible we might be able to share capnography. Um, there's there's typically capnography with every ventilator that exists in a hospital already. Um, it, we really should be using, using capnography 100% of the time, but if we were only using capnography um, when the patient was induced or when they became unstable, um, that could be a working, workable, um, a workable solution okay. um, as well. Okay, thank you. So um, Amy Kovelowitz, uh, who um, I happen to know runs the Rice Ambubag project, ask a question about um, making lighter, cheaper ventilators for the third world. Uh, could, you, could you just state one sentence about that, Dr. Schultz, please? Yeah, I, listen, I think the, IC, the third world will need good ventilators. I don't think a cheap ventilator that keeps patients in their intensive care units for days or weeks extra will be a good economy. I think we're better off making a robust ventilator with with redundant monitoring and good user interfaces. Um, so I think it's a false economy, I think, to, to, make, okay. them, to make them too cheap. Thank you. Um, I'd like to point out that um, Sandy uh, says, um, Michelle gave a great presentation. I'd like to, I don't know, Michelle, you can think about this question. Um, you're just gonna have 30 seconds to answer it. Um, do doctors have to consider different types of ventilators based on the patient's level of lung injury? And I, I'm sure that's a complicated question. Um, let me direct this question to Chris, uh, to um, Eric, and then we'll finish up with Michelle answering that question when she gets off mute. Eric, Chris Young, uh, who is a, a ventilator maker with uh, helpful engineering, uh, asked, how do you increase practitioners, and I think he means makers like himself and, and myself, digestion of knowledge? Um, all of us are researching to try to understand this. You, of course, have written documents about it, but what advice do you have for us as you know, engineers who aren't MDs? Yep, um, keep it simple, control the things that you can control. So this essentially comes down to delivered flow and pressure waves. Um, yeah, gas has got basic properties. It's got you know, temperature, humidity, the composition of the gas, the fraction of oxygen, and, and then pressure and flow. And that's all you can control. Um, and I've done, I read my documents because I've done my utmost um, to break it down into just the core bits and not you know, you know, drown you in a six month respiratory physiology course. Okay. We have some other excellent questions, but we don't have time to answer them. I'm sorry, Michelle. Uh, were you able to unmute, or Michelle, are you there, Ms. Malinting? 
Okay. okay, I think I'm here now. Um, really quickly, I think, you know, the question of different types of ventilators based on injury is very true. I think there is a definitely a role for non-invasive ventilation. And I think in severe cases of, of COVID-19, I think sort of a, a, a treatment could progress sort of in a way where you have, you know, nasal cannula with oxygen, oxygen and then you would place a, a patient prone. In fact, 99% uh, of physicians and experts uh, in an ATS document guideline actually recommended prone positioning. And then from there, um, you know, non-invasive -invas ventilation has actually been shown to keep 20 to 30% of people off of invasive ventilators, where we know the odds are 50-50. So I think the more you can do to try to keep someone off of an invasive mechanical ventilator, um, the better. And so I think really there, there is um, a role for uh, devices that don't require as much many resources like drugs and other things um, uh, to use them. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry, there are some excellent questions here, but we, we don't have time to answer them. And I want to go on to the next session. So thank you very much.